You just saw the lights flickering on and off. Originally, uh, I had wanted to do that to kind of establish that the lights in this uh, hospital were a little bit faulty so the guard wouldn't get so crazy suspicious later on when the lights totally went, uh, went off. And originally, uh, this room had the lights flickering randomly as you wandered around, and I kind of liked that. Although I realized when I started getting more graphical elements in, the door opens and shut, you know, the guard fiddling with the, with the antenna and, and all this stuff, that it just got to be uh, much more complicated than I had originally wanted it to be because the lights, light levels wouldn't match. Um, I do an animation for you know the door opening, but the door opening would be for the you know the lit room, and then the guard animating for the uh, the radio. You know that was also for the for the lit version of the room, and switching back and forth, you know it just got way too complicated. And eventually I decided, eh, forget it. I'll just have the lights flicker when the elevator doors open and shut. And in a way that kind of makes sense because I used to have a printer actually that every time you printed something the lights in my apartment would get dangerously dim and start flickering on and off so this isn't entirely out of out of laziness you can logically justify it so uh, I hope I can be forgiven Francisco Gonzalez you might recognize from uh, Shiva uh, he did the voice of the detective in Shiva and now he plays another sort of law enforcement guy he plays the the, the hospital rent-a-cop um, and he was very patient Francisco was very very patient with me because I kind of waited until like the uh, very very end to send in the script because I wanted to, to kind of make sure I had everything um, in place in the uh, in the script Bible and of course as I as being disorganized I had left you know about six or seven lines out of it and I would email him in a panic and be like hey here's hey, 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 the lines and so he would he would dutifully send them back like by the next day you'd re-record and he did a great job he's easy to work with he does great work and he writes great games too he has a, a series of games called Ben Jordan paranormal investigator um, he go under uh, he goes under the name Grundislav games he calls himself Grundislav uh, on the internet um, I think he's up to number six or five or seven uh, in the series. He's so prolific, it's very hard to keep track. So, uh, Ben Jordan, Francisco Gonzalez, Grandislav Games. Check him out. Uh, Dr. Quentin, who I now should call Dr. Backstory or Dr. Exposition. Uh, again, another uh, what was I thinking and apology moment. Rosa has a very complicated backstory. She's got her aunt and grandmother and all that stuff, and that needed to be related to the player in some way. And uh, I did that through this doctor and the letters later. I'll talk about those letters later. Um, and I think this was a really bad way of handling it. The one thing I've learned over five years of making these games is that info dumps, especially big info dumps like this, are bad. Uh, number one, they're boring, especially in an adventure game like this, because the characters don't move or do anything. So having all that inf information being thrown at you when there's nothing interesting to capture your attention, it's just, it's just bad, bad design. And also, so much information is being thrown at you uh, during this very boring thing, so you're not processing you're not processing it very well, uh, and you you miss it all. So if I could redo things, if I could be George Lucas, which I'm not going to do, uh, I would have figured out a way to parcel all this information out a little better over the course of the game, so uh, the player could have processed it better, um, which I didn't do five years ago when I made this game. I have learned since then. I make a point of not doing this uh, now when I make games. Uh, again, my first game, I apologize. You might recognize uh, the voice of the doctor as the same guy who did the voice of Rabbi Zelig in the Shiva. And the guy behind the voice, his name is Joe Rodriguez, and I know him from my improv group. And Joe is such a funny, funny, funny guy. Um, man, this guy, he's just, he's so funny. I can't even explain how. He's just really funny. Um, but he's got this great, uh, baritone, as you can, as you can hear. And I, I wanted the doctor to have this kind of very calm, uh, maybe even slightly clinical, but deep voice. And I knew Joe would be perfect. And so, um, he lives kind of far away from me, uh, very far. He lives in Connecticut. I live in New York. And so, uh, I knew he'd be perfect, and but I know he actually has professional equipment in his house, so he could do all the voices from his house, 
and he is such a good actor, I didn't have to worry about having to constantly be on hand to direct him. So I was willing to kind of let him let him do his own thing. And if I really wanted something to change, I I would uh, tell him. But uh, I never had to ask him to change anything because uh, everything was everything was perfect. Joe could nail it every single time without any direction. So yay, Joe! Joe is awesome. And uh, if Joe does not make it in the world of voice actoring, then uh, that's a crime. That's a big crime. So best of luck, Joe. Rosa is not sappy about her family. She's very realistic. She kind of pushes those feelings away. And a lot of the beta testers noted the fact. They said, hey, Rosa is such a bitch about her aunt. I mean, holy crap. She's just so mean. And this was totally done on purpose. She doesn't always necessarily think what she says. Uh, the doctor is trying to invade her personal space, and she kind of retaliates by uh, saying this really nasty stuff, and uh, she knows it's nasty, and she's really just trying to get a reaction out of him. It's just this very neurotic thing that she's doing, because Rosa does care. Uh, she visited her aunt every week. You'll see later on she asks Joey many questions about her aunt. Uh, she wants to know about her. She wants to know about her family. But up until now, um, it was something that was always denied to her. So she's always very realistic and doesn't like to dwell on those feelings because nothing would ever come of them. So she kind of just shoved it away and uh, pretended that it didn't bother her. So that's really uh, the essence of who Rosa is at this moment in time, and if she does act like a bit of an ice queen, that's totally on purpose. The music here, if you pay attention, is a very subtle ticking noise, and I was told later on that it was it's a cool noise, but it was also a reference to the original, a very subtle reference to the original Bestowers of Eternity, where uh, you had to do a really, really awful puzzle, and for that I'm sorry, involving a stopwatch, uh, involving a stopwatch with an alarm clock, you had to... Uh, I'm going to give away the puzzle here because it was um, it was so bad that I'm not, it's not giving anything away. Where you had to lie down on the doctor's couch and he hypnotized you and he would leave the room. And uh, in order to wake up while the doctor was still out, you'd have to set your stopwatch to wake you up while the doctor was out. It was a really horrible puzzle. And I did not include that in this game, uh, not by a long shot. It was so awful. Um, you know, I'm sorry about that. I really am sorry about that original horrible puzzle. I like to pretend the original bestowers never existed. <laughs> I have to be totally honest. A lot of people tell me that it was the best thing I did, and God, I, I hope not. I, I really hope not. I look at that now, and I just wince. Uh, I hope I managed to redeem myself with... Uh, with the Blackwell legacy. That's another reason why I changed the title. I just don't want to be associated with Bestowers of Eternity anymore. But anyway, yeah, the music, clock ticking, reference, uh, yeah. I guess I could talk a little bit more about the creation of this room. I mentioned earlier how Tom Scary drew the room, uh, which isn't entirely true. Chris Fimo actually uh, drew a lot of it as well. Tom Scary drew the basic outline. He did the um, the walls, the kitchen, the table, the, the shelf, the computer desk, and all that. And then Chris Fimo came along, and uh, after Tom Scary became too busy to finish, Chris Fimo added so many extra details. He kind of took what he knew about Rosa. He created that bulletin board for her newspaper clippings. He put the teddy bear up there, which is a reference to one of my earlier games. Uh, I kind of um, wanted that there. Uh, he added um, the bedroom behind the door. He added the plants, which I totally wasn't expecting. I never thought of Rosa as a, as a plant girl. So I included a message saying they were fake. That's, that's more of a Rosa thing. Uh, he added all those books. Uh, he added the notebook there. Um, he added the couch and the table. Uh, the end table, so I had to redo all the walkable areas, so uh, yeah, thanks Chris. <laughs> but he really, uh, really helped make the room come alive, so uh, good job, man. When I created the original freeware uh, Bestowers of Eternity in 2002, uh, was it 2003? Gosh, it was a while ago. Anyway, um, people told me that the letters that Rosa reads was their favorite part of the game. Actually, that was, it seemed to be the thing that made the game. I don't. I wonder if I didn't put those letters in there. If people would have liked it so much, but um, I hope that the it's just as effective in Blackwell Legacy, even though I kind of moved the focus away from Rosa and her family to the case that Rosa is working on. If only because the backstory is now so much bigger and so much better that it's going to take a, a while to to get to it. So I kind of wanted to give you a little taste of the backstory now, and then um, in the future you'll see more. So hopefully um, you're not kept in total suspense, but uh, in the meantime this is uh, a bit of Rosa, Rosangela Blackwell backstory that you get for now. I'm afraid this is another what was I thinking and I'm sorry moment. 
Uh, I don't know why I thought uh, making the player read through 25 pages of old letters was a good idea, but uh, apparently I did, and I can only <laughs> apologize for that. This was horrible design, and I'm being really overly critical with myself. Um, but, you know, I was f five years ago. It doesn't seem like that uh, huge amount of time, but I have, feel like I've learned a lot since then because I look at this now and I'm like, what? Why did I do that? And I thought about editing these letters down. Uh, but in the end, I kept them because I do like them. I think that uh, the story they tell is quite compelling. And if you go on to play the next game in the series, a lot of the things you learn in these letters come to play there. So I kept them. But if I, again, could do this all over, I would have uh, I would have done it a lot differently. You'll notice here that it's signed Jack and not Jacko. This was sort of my little way of showing that uh, Jack was growing up. This was his turning point. He's no longer Jacko. He's now Jack. He's a this has changed his life. He's a totally different person, blah, blah, blah. It's a subtle thing, but uh, hopefully it got through to some people. I have a blog, uh, like most people do these days. Uh, you can find it linked off of the Wajedai Games website. And there was an entry I wrote about a year and a half ago uh, where I talked about how I learned not to write such lengthy dialogues. And I used Blackwell Legacy as an example of when I wrote really lengthy dialogues. And I decided to take one of the dialogues from Blackwell Legacy, transcribe it, and uh, rewrite it. I said, this is how I would write it now. And I used this conversation between Rosa and her boss as the example. And the original conversation was about like 45 lines or something like that. It was really long. And it was even especially more boring because you don't see the other character, the other characters on the phone. And then on the blog, I edited it down to like maybe 16 lines instead. And I said, well, you know, I uh, this is how I would do this if I was redoing the game. And since I am redoing the game, I decided, well, why not use that revamp dialogue? So I did. So this is the one place I really edited heavily. Uh, there's other parts of the game where I cut lines, but this is the only place where I edited them. Uh, and I think it's a lot tighter and cleaner as a result. All right, new option on the menu. Uh, yeah, you just got the notebook. Um, one of the things people really seem to like about the Shiva, uh, and they kind of praised me for being original, was the notebook, was the notes interface, the clues interface, how you'd use clues as, in, as inventory, and they praised how awesome and original that was. I want to deny this, because I feel that credit should be given to Discworld Noir. Uh, the third game in the Discworld series, which is a beautiful noir adventure, and actually inspired me to create mystery adventure games. And the Discworld noir had clues as inventory. They did it first, not me. <laughs> so I want to give those guys credit. So just all that credit you're giving to me, give it to Discworld noir. They deserve it. I often make a big thing about how I'm more professional with VO recording now because I used to have this headset mic that I just gave the actors, um, but now I have a Blue Yeti USB mic and it's all professional and the sound quality is so much better and the actors can, can stand up and project and uh, I'm all professional and stuff with my VO recording. But when Rebecca was recording uh, Rosa, there was this one session where um, the Occupy Wall Street folks decided to march past my window. <laughs> And normally my apartment's pretty quiet, but not that day. Uh, so occasionally, if you are wearing headphones and have the volume up really high, you might be able to hear while Rose is talking the sound of sirens or bullhorns or, or things like that. Uh, so, you know, I'm not as professional as, I, as I'd like to be sometimes. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that I looked after a dog, my friend's dog, for a week, and I took the dog to Washington Square Park. That dog was a Boston Terrier, and that dog's name was Cooper, and then the owner's name was Sarah. And I really based Nishanti's relationship with Moti, which means pearl in Hindi, by the way, I based that relationship on Sarah's relationship with Cooper. And uh, I love Boston Terriers. Ever since I looked after Cooper, I just become obsessed with these little squishy nose guys. And everything, all the little tricks that Modi does here, Cooper does the exact same thing. The whole go get it thing, uh, Sarah did the exact same thing. She'd hold out the treat, the dog would beg, and she'd say, go get it. And the dog would just snap the treat right up. So I, I totally based that on, on Cooper. And, uh, you know, man, you know, people and their dogs. I happen to be allergic, so I, I cannot actually own a dog permanently. But that's all right. Allergies won't stop me from putting a, a dog in a game. So I can live vicariously through my games and, and have a dog that way. Not quite like the real thing, but it's the closest I'm ever going to get. I think this line might have been a little too subtle. There was a bit of um, subtext there that I'm not sure if people got or not. But basically, if it wasn't for the strike, Nishanti and Rosa would never have met. 
And so when Rosa gets all in a huff about the strike being over so soon, uh, Nishanti's a tiny little bit insulted, even though it's... Um, she knows it's totally unintentional, it was totally an innocent thing to say, but she's a little bit insulted. And it's extremely subtle, and I don't know if anyone picked up on it or not, but that's what this commentary is for. So, uh, lucky you. A problem with a lot of Nishanti's lines here is that it's just straight information giving without a lot of character. And when Ruth read the lines, we found it very difficult to give it some give it something. And so we kind of talked about ways to give each line some subtext. And I, I'm giving this information to you in advance, so you'll be ready. Uh, they're about to talk about uh, the newspaper that Rosa works for. And I told Ruth, I said, hey, you know, Ruth, uh, the character, Nishanti, she's going to say, oh, I've never actually read it, but maybe I will. I said to Ruth, I said, hey, you know what? You actually have read these newspapers, and you use them to house train your dog. So you feel guilty about it. And so that's how she read the line. And, you know, it's not something that anyone would get. There's no way you would get that. But you'll definitely notice that there's a little bit more character to the line than there would have been otherwise. So it was a little little trick that we that we did to make the lines a little sound a little more interesting. There's a game called The Longest Journey, which is critically acclaimed, but uh, it's a great game, you should all play it. But one common complaint, and a complaint I have, is that you could spend hours talking to the peripheral characters. And it's not so much that there's a lot of dialogue, nothing wrong with a lot of dialogue, but it's just that the dialogue itself, uh, like you could spend an hour talking to the main character whose name is April. You could speak, spend an hour talking to April's landlady, learn the landlady's life story. And you'd never see the landlady again. None of that information moves the story along. And I found myself doing the same thing with Nishanti here. It was very tempting to delve into Nishanti's life story and learn everything about her. And I held myself back. But what I decided to do instead, uh, to kind of justify long dialogues with Nishanti, because I think she's a cool character, was to um, spin everything you ask Nishanti into learning something about Rosangela. You'll see in this dialogue how um, you, you're talking about Nishanti's pet, and then Nishanti asks Rosa a question back. Hey, did you have a pet? And so you learn that Rosangela never had a pet. She grew up with a teddy bear. Uh, so in learning about Nishanti, it actually moves the story along a bit because you learn more about Rosa, the character you're playing. So that was sort of my, my wacky, crazy plan when, uh, when writing these dialogues.